Dossier listeners, here's part two of my conversation with writer, author, and journalist Randall Sullivan. I hope you enjoyed part one. Each week, I keep getting more and more questions about the story of Phil Carson and the elements of the dossier. As we head into 2024, it actually surprises me that there still are open-ended questions, still mystery. What can be done here in 2024? What else can actually be put forth? I got a few ideas. Is it possible I could file some more Freedom of Information Act requests to the LAPD? Are there any documents that still exist that can be found or acquired? Can Perry Sanders reveal any more information or evidence that journalists can continue to unearth? I can challenge some of the listeners to make a list of individuals who haven't talked that you would want to hear from, interviews that are left to be done, or work that needs to be expanded. I guess there's a case to be made until this murder is solved. There's more work to do, more episodes to write, and a third and closing act of this story. The another character that we all know well, very recently I bought a burner phone, I put it in a package, and I sent it to an address where I believe Chuck Phillips lives, and I said, Hey Chuck, if you feel like talking, I one, I would love to speak to you, and two, I have some money for you, th- hoping maybe that would smoke him out, but that hasn't worked as of yet. What is your overall analysis of how, mu- in this day and age, how a guy has literally almost fallen off the face of the earth? Well, Chuck Phillips is a smart guy, and he had, you know, a savvy guy in a lot of ways, and he has a you know, he probably has a, a network of connections, you know, in the, what we might call the underworld that, that uh, you know, few have. I, I don't know if it is so that made him, you know, stop pursuing some sort of vindication, which he was, you know, he was really, he hadn't given it up, even though he had basically nothing uh, to to work with other than, uh, his belief in his own powers of persuasion. But, I mean, honestly, I just figured that Chuck was probably dead because, you know, that's the only way we wouldn't have heard from him, you know, especially after Dead Wrong was published. The comment that Randall made here was a bit shocking and through the rumor mill and work of Nicole Luciano, we're hearing that Chuck is possibly working on something. Randall is right. Say what you want about Chuck Phillips, but he built up a dream team of sources inside law enforcement all across the country and inside the corridors of power in hip hop's golden age. For a guy to just walk away and disappear, man, it fucking defies belief. So could it be possible that Chuck Phillips has one last creative endeavor? a book, a TV series, a documentary. Maybe 2024 is the year Chuck surfaces. Yeah, no, he's alive and well. And we have, or I had an investigator find pictures of him at a bus station. We had some family Christmas photos we found of him and a potential address of a family member we felt he was staying at and have tried a number of different ways with with no luck. Do you think in a weird way he also has some answers to some of this stuff or or, or you don't believe that? He knows things for sure. He knows certainly, you know, what story Suge Knight was telling and selling. And, you know, he probably knows a lot about the machinations uh, around Suge to you know, control the narrative and, and push the story in one direction or another. I think Suge was his primary source for a lot of the stuff, you know, the, the false stuff that uh, uh, was published in the LA Times under his byline. So, uh, yeah, I think he, he probably knows a lot. I mean, you know, when... Uh, you know, he, he desperately wanted Phil Carson, you know, to, to win his confidence. He came out with, you know, pretty 
overwhelming uh, bit of evidence against the number two guy in the LAPD. I mean, he actually had tapes, tape recordings of the guy implicating himself. Who knows what else Chuck might have. I wanted you to clarify, you released Dead Wrong, and then did you also release like an addition to it about a source you found uh, that was close to Mac? I did. I, don't, I guess that was in the you know, paperback revised edition. And yes, there was a source close to Mac who told me a lot of things, only some of which I used uh, in the book. Uh, and it, it wasn't because I even had to promise not to use the material. It's just, it just seemed like it was going to, you know, harm other people, you know, perhaps unfairly or unnecessarily, you know. And so I just kept it quiet, on, you know, on a couple of fronts. In Randall's answer... I felt it was important to go back to his book, Dead Wrong, and read an excerpt to make sure all the information was presented here to you. The actual text reads, quote, Recently, a person who has been a close friend of David Max for decades contacted me after what he said were seven or eight viewings of the film City of Lies, which is based on my book Labyrinth. I had an odd conversation with this individual, whose identity I've promised to protect. Odd because even though the person was revealing damning information about Mac's role in the Wallace murder, he made considerable effort to portray his friend Mac in a sympathetic light. I've since independently verified this individual's relationship to Mac with evidence submitted at Mac's trial for the Bank of America robbery. According to this old friend, Mac was living more or less on the streets of Compton from an early age, stealing food just to feed himself as a boy of nine or 10. He joined the mob Pyru Bloods at the age of 13, mainly as a way of seeking some form of protection and connection and remained a mob Pyru at least until his release from prison as a man in his 50s. While at Oregon, Mac lived a sort of double life, one as a successful college athlete who was popular with people of all races, and another as a Bloods gang member who was mob Pyru all the way whenever he came back to Compton. The really important information Mac's friend provided was of course about the Wallace murder. Russell Poole had it exactly right, this person told me. Mac had been hired by Suge Knight to arrange the shooting that took place outside the Peterson Automotive Museum. And just as Poole had come to believe, Mac coordinated that shooting with the help from Rafael Perez and other LAPD. Mac personally contracted with his friend Amir Muhammad to be the trigger man. What Poole apparently didn't know, though, and what Mac's friend said, was that the primary target outside the Peterson that night was not big, but rather Puffy Combs. It was Puff's sheer good luck that the SUV he was in had been able to blow through a yellow light where the vehicle Biggie was in would stop on the red moments later. David Mack had guaranteed Muhammad a considerable sum of money, close to $200,000. Mack's friend said, though he admitted he wasn't sure of the amount to execute Puffy and Biggie. The problem was that Suge Knight said he wasn't paying for a job that was only half done, less than half done. In fact, as far as he was concerned, Puffy was who Suge really wanted dead. According to his friend, David is a very loyal person, very loyal. And he felt Amir Muhammad was owed. He'd given his word, but he didn't have that kind of money. That was why he robbed the Bank of America to pay Muhammad. Only after Mac's arrest did Suge Knight acknowledge his own vulnerability the criminal charges in connection to the Biggie slang, the friend said, and offered to pay for Mac's attorney. In return, Mac agreed to maintain his silence. 
it's probably hard for you to understand. But for David, doing 15 years in prison was not something that he worried about. He accepted it as part of the deal. He never would have snitched. You aware that I spoke to him, right? Or no? No, I didn't know. Yeah, I I spoke to to Mac for about 45 minutes. And I I can send you the audio of that if you're interested in it. Yeah, I I would be. So he's, I mean, he's a genial grandfather, you know, you know, doing, you know, uh, green energy, you know, or something. Right. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, listen, he, 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 I'd be curious your thoughts once you listen to the audio. But one thing I did pull away from it, I have this moment to him where I say something like, well, what will you talk about? Calling him on the mat. I said, would you talk about, you know, Rampart? He said, of course. Would you talk about the bank robbery? He said, of course. I stopped short of just throwing Biggie in his face because I didn't feel there was, you know, the need to do that on a first phone call, right? I kind of wanted to keep him on the line. But he did say something that I thought was really interesting. And he said, how come you you don't want to talk to me about growing up in Compton? I said, of course, I, w- I want to talk to you about growing up in Compton. To make a long story short, he basically told me he wanted about $250,000 to tell his story. Where this becomes a question to you is I've heard very recently that Netflix is dabbling in doing the Rampart story. And that Tiller Russell, who did the Waco documentary, is working on a Rampart Netflix documentary that quite possibly could have Mac or Perez or both of them. Now, with what you have always contended around the Rampart scandal, how do you do a work of a documentary with two people that you don't know are telling the truth? Well, you know for sure, it's certainly in Perez's case, he's not telling the truth. He's a proven liar, you know, multiple times. I mean, I wouldn't, there's absolutely nothing Perez says that should be taken at face value. And if this guy is basing whoever it is, if Netflix is going to do a documentary in which they treat Rafael Perez like a credible source, then it's a joke. 90% of what Perez said was, was made up. It was pure fabrication or, you know, a, a total distortion of something that was true. I mean, he is a pathological liar and a, and a guy with absolutely no conscience or character at all. One final note that I'm curious in talking to this friend of Mac was the importance of the revised edition of putting this information there. Was it a revelation for you or is it was it more of a confirmation of information and narrative around things that you all, everyone always thought, but we're looking for sources to confirm it. Well, he certainly told me things I'd never heard before. And, and you know, I, I, they aren't things that I could verify. You know, it's just, and I think, I, I hope I kept it, you know, expressed it in terms of this is what this person claims. So this person was in a position to know if, as few people were. But certainly his claim that, you know, Mac did the bank robbery in order to get the money to pay off Amir Muhammad for killing Biggie when Suge refused to was not something I'd ever heard before. Do you, in in finality, believe that at a certain point in, say, the next few years, there will be a few individuals who maybe have a, a crisis of conscience maybe are just fed up for whatever reason and come forward with more information, i.e. someone within the LAPD. Do you do you ever believe that somebody who knew a lot of this and the mechanics of this will ever come forward and speak about it in a way that would move the needle? Well, it sure seems like they would ha- have by now. But I think a big part of the problem is that the media hasn't really wanted to hear the truth. I mean, I don't, I'm not prejudging this Netflix documentary, but if the conventional, you know, supposedly official description depiction of the Rampart scandal is going to be, 
you know, the subject of this, then the whole thing's a fraud because the, the Rampart scandal was mostly a fraud. I mean, the Rampart scandal was most, the scandal was uh, Perez, Durden, Mack, Sammy Martin, you know, that, that was the scandal. It wasn't all, nearly all the stories of the other things going on in Rampart Division were either made up, greatly exaggerated, terribly distorted. You know, it was really a crock, but you would never find that out reading the LA Times. At one point, you know, when I was fencing back and forth with the LA Times, I, Leo Wurlitzer, who was that time, I think, the managing editor, said, uh, well, okay, you know, we, the, the Rampart scandal wasn't exactly what we thought it was. And I said, well, then why don't you, you know, publish a mea culpa saying, you know, we misrepresented this story and he just sort of, you know, laughed it off like, yeah, sure, we'd do that. You know, why would we do that to ourselves? Uh, and nobody else in L.A. has done, you know, has, has really tried to set the record straight. So... You know, who, you know, who's the audience? Who wants to do it? I mean, maybe this Netflix documentary will astound me and actually be, you know, a truthful, thoughtful exploration of the subject. And I, I think it would be great if it was. Yeah. But, and, you know, I, I've worked with Phil now for, you know, four or five years. And I'm curious about, because I know you sat with him and talked with him. And where I've landed with Phil is I actually think he has a lot more information than he's revealing. Do you feel the same? He must. I mean, you know, he, you know, he's got to. I mean, just say that, you know, I talked to a couple of other FBI agents who were working there at the time. And, you know, it had to be totally off the record. I had to promise not to repeat it Uh and certainly not, to, you know, with any attribution to them. But, but they both said, I mean, you know, Phil was right. You know, Phil was in the midst of this. He, you know, he saw everything that was happening. If, if he is holding back anything, it's probably because he feels it's going to injure the reputation of someone he he feels doesn't deserve that. I don't think he'd be sitting on it because, you know, for some ultimate, you know, personal or hidden agenda. I think he would just it would just be. You know, kind of conscientious sort of withholding. Yeah. And I mean, you know, coming up on the 30, 30 year mark, if you really put it into context between the fabricated Rampart scandal, the Ruben Palomares story, which I think has not gotten enough press around the idea of, you know, an LAPD officer in bed with the Sinaloa drug cartel. Yeah. And yeah, then. No. And then the sort of, you know, trifecta of Phil in the middle of the biggie. There's a case to be made that in a 30 year period, the LAPD saw some of the biggest police scandals our country has ever seen. And that's absolutely true. And but the fact is, those those scandals are like an iceberg. What you see is, you know, really just the tip of it. And what you've been told about what's under the water is mostly not true. I mean, if somebody would just do a thorough exploration, I did the best I could, and I think I did a pretty good job, but I didn't go all the way. Just uh, the role that Michelle Par Parks played, Bernard Parks' daughter played in this whole story, and the relationship uh, between the Bloods and the LAPD and Suge Knight and the LAPD and uh, Perez and Mac and that whole group. I mean, there's somebody who knows a whole lot about what happened and who was involved. And she's never been compelled to address it. She got protected by her father and then the rest and the rest of the uh, law enforcement establishment and went along with it. I, I did speak recently to an LAPD investigator who was around at that time and was a part of of the original Wilshire division that went out and just was in the mix. He off the record, blah, blah, blah. And his comment to me, I thought was interesting. And he felt with Mac and a few others that it, there actually was a concerted effort by the Pyru Bloods to infiltrate the LAPD. 
And that Mac from the start was a gang member and sort of knowingly went into the LAPD to do what he did. Do you have find any truth in that? I think that's entirely possible. I don't, you know, people have said to me things like that uh, and about Perez as well. I don't know. The, the narrative I carry, carry around in my head is that Mac sort of changed. I mean, the, the source that we're referring to, I mean, he's somebody who knew Mac you know, their relationship was formed when they were in college together as college athletes. So he saw a completely different David Mack and uh, and sort of, you know, retained a relationship with that person he knew, but realized this other person had started to, this other David Mack existed too. And I think he himself wondered if that had always been sort of there, that he brought that with him from Compton, or if it was something he you know, developed, you know, but, but people would have said the same thing about Suge Knight. Nobody who knew Suge Knight up to, you know, his sophomore or junior year in college would have thought that he was going to be some gang boss. You know, that isn't, that is, you know, that, that whole conception of himself seems to have been something he formed much later. And I, I guess I thought that was true of Mac too, but, but I'm not sure. I keep saying final question, but this really will be the final question. I I just am curious. There seems to be now with this recent news around the Tupac case, I would say a new theory that is growing within some journalists, some people on the Internet. And that is the idea that Kevin Gaines was involved in the Tupac murder. When you hear that. Like, does your mind go conspiracy theory or, oh, that could make sense? Well, I, I you know, I, I guess the most I could say is that I wouldn't just dismiss it out of hand. You know, Ke- Kevin Gaines was, you know, doing all he could to be on the inside with, with uh, Death Row. Uh, I've never, I've never heard any evidence that he was in Las Vegas at that time. I know that I know there were other cops who were, other LAPD cops who were, but uh, he's not one I've ever heard was actually there. Well, Randall, as always, my man, I really appreciate, you know, your thoughts. I hope you have a happy holidays. I'm glad you're on to other intellectual pursuits. Yes, well, I'm, I'm glad I am too, but I mean, I'm not absolutely ruling out that, you know, I'm going to be pulled back into this one but it's going to take something unforeseen to do that a lot yeah i hear you i hear you all right my man we'll have a have a good rest of your evening okay okay you too don